Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, July 23rd, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. I'm not authorized to give you personal financial advice. Please do your own due diligence, your own research, it's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so there's been a lot of consternation, and I've got a lot of communication from subscribers of the newsletter and, and the videos about the oil price or commodity prices in general. As I've said before, just to reiterate, you know, over the course of the decade, this decade, I believe, the next 10 years, plus or minus, um, I believe that we're going to be in a resource bull market. Uh, as we've discussed many times in the past, this is going to be mostly because on the supply side, the starving of capital for new resources. Obviously, we've used the term extractive industries. All of these businesses are extractive industries. And so if you're not spending money to find new resources that you've produced, at some point you go out of business. And so we haven't been doing that. And therefore, you know, the demand for these materials that allow for civilization, whether they're various metals, uh, petroleum products, whatever, we're seeing the beginning oscillations, tremors of what can happen when there's insufficient material. Now, uh, in some of these cases are man-made because of the sanctions that have been put on, uh, ill-advised in my view, but uh, regardless, uh, they've been put on. And so this is causing, you know, shortages. And we still haven't, in many cases, recovered from the pandemic-related supply chain issues. And so balancing that against demand, which is going to fluctuate, right? So uh, I've been very clear on my view that I believe that the United States is already in a recession. Uh, the interest rate tracker that I track has, I think, almost 60 to 70 central banks around the world are tightening liquidity, raising rates. That's typically, typically going to lead to lower economic activity and growth. And so there's going to be periods over this decade where we have short-term periods of demand uh, declines or stagnation that's going to cause the price of these resources to go down. What I think you're going to notice, though, unless we have a full-blown repeat of the 2008 crisis or some other lockdown-type situation, is that when we do see the lows for the cycle, they're going to be progressively higher. And that's what I'm forecasting. So, you know, we got out of some of the things that because of the tightening liquidity, as I've said also in the past on these videos, sediment, sediment being, you know, how people view the market attitude towards these asset classes is negative because people feel like we're going into a recession. And so that's what happens, right? The sediment changes to we're going to go into a recession and then the linear thinking takes over. So immediately the reference point for a lot of people is the COVID-induced economic lockdown crash, if you will, or 2008. So that's not necessarily the case, but uh, we can't know the future exactly. So we are in a recession. Uh, flash PMIs came out today. Service sector is below 50. So that's, you know, basically what has happened is the sugar high of all the free stimmy money has run out. Uh, the Fed has ostensibly reversed its liquid stance. I mean, even though they're not withdrawing uh, the QT, not taking place at the pace that uh, they suggested. But rates are increasing. People's view towards this is that liquidity is tightening, and therefore from that, a, you know, a economic decline should happen or recession, and that recession is going to be bad. So front run everything and sell all this stuff. So um, nevertheless, the seeds of the next liquidity cycle are already planted because as the recession takes place, 
um, there will be eventually a a turn in policy and then a shift in sediment and the sediment will bottom and then as we see the the cycle begin to turn a new liquidity cycle then rinse and repeat we'll see prices so my my view is is that uh, i think that people are going or the uh powers that be the fed are uh, probably not going to raise rates as far as people think. As a matter of fact, I saw some data today uh, that uh, the first interest rate cut is being uh, forecasted for the first quarter of 2023, which is only five or six months away. So uh, maybe it even happens sooner than that, depending on how fast the economy goes down. Um, I'm following various real estate markets just for my own interest and seeing price cuts all over the place. I'm going to start spending some time when I'm back in Houston on, uh, excuse me, on um, some weekends going around some uh, open houses and feeling out the market and see what's really going on. But anyways, what I wanted to get to was, is that this is all very interesting sediment and liquidity in the short term can affect things. But in the long term, I believe the supply uh, the inability of supply to keep up with growing demand over time will be the overriding factor in the short term punctuated with declines because of liquidity and recessions and things like that. So this is the uh, EIA report came out and it had some interesting, uh, interesting information. So on the left, you'll see the graph. It's the new well oil production per rig uh, with 2021 and 22, in every basin, the new wells are producing less barrels of, of oil per day uh, per rig. Uh, so that's not good. Well, with the, maybe with the case of Appalachia, but that's such a small amount of oil being produced. But major basins, you're getting less oil per, per rig. And then I also wanted to which is not good. So you're drilling holes, but getting less oil. Uh, then you look at the legacy oil production, it's declining in all the basins uh, and it's accelerating from last year. Why? Because uh, you know these things are not like cornucopias of never ending resources. There's this view out there that some people have that you know, if you remember back in the salad days of during the Trump administration, the drill baby drill days, we're going to go to 20 or 25 million barrels a day of production. We were going, we had trillions of barrels of oil. We were going to be the new Saudi Arabia, yada, yada, yada. And that's not really the case. Okay. That never was the case. And so what's happening here is that we're seeing the productions uh, accelerate year over year. As we see the replacement wells that are being drilled are less productive year over year. So this is, this is not good. And this is all building to a, what I want to talk about later on. So the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank, uh, they have an energy survey that they do uh, as part of their reporting. And I, this was a tweet that was put out by Shy Girl. And she un, under, somebody underlined some of these things here. But this is basically uh, comments from exploration and production firms that are within the purview of the Dallas Federal Reserve, this respect to energy. So let's go over a couple of these. Um, government animosity towards our industry makes us reluctant to pursue new projects. So what's been communicated to the hydrocarbons sector in the United States? If you remember President Biden, uh, I always say, watch what they do, right? So remember during the campaign, he walked up to that teenager with the microphone and said, I promise you, we are going to get rid of fossil fuels. Uh, and then as this, have they've got, as, as they've been in power, that's exactly what they're doing to the extent that they can to hinder new exploration, to make more property off limits. and. Uh, you know, so that's that's what the 
the industry is saying about this. So let's go on. Um, the real energy crisis isn't even here yet. The US EIA forecasts US oil production to average 12.5 million barrels per day for the next 30 years. This is all but impossible. Remember, this is the industry saying this, okay, in regards to questions and comments solicited by the Dallas Federal Reserve Board. This is all but impossible. Shale will likely trip tip into terminal decline in about five years. So we're not gonna have 20 million barrels. We're not even gonna have 12 or 13 million barrels of production a day forever. As the main shale plays run out of locations, unfortunately by then, most of the individuals with incumbent knowledge about offshore and international development will have retired. The brain drain in the industry will create a real and much larger crisis in the mid to late 2020s. Going on, the current administration declared war on fossil fuels before going into office and have continued that war to this day. Mixed messages from politicians remain unhelpful to longer term projects and commitments. Politicians need the reminder that a barrel of oil does not go directly into the gas tank of a car. Broadly speaking, permitting of all kinds remains difficult, if not impossible, and the lead times are forever. Remember, you take a barrel of oil out of the ground, it has to be refined. Our refining capacity has atrophied by 5% during the pandemic. And you're never going to build it. Once those things are shut down, you're not going to build another one here in the U.S. under the current regime, regulatory regime, whether Republican or Democrat, in my view. Um, Although the question regarding availability of inputs has not affected me, this is, remember, these are comments from different people. It has had a significant impact on business decisions, especially whether or not to drill and or participate in new wells. Um, going on, I hope this industry can weather the outrageous current assaults and the tidal wave of more of them to come from the administration. So this is how the industry is viewing the current environment. And so if you're in the industry and this is your view currently, you're not going to go out and invest new, new into new oil and gas reserves. You're just not going to do it. So that's why you're seeing you know, these high prices uh, generating tremendous cash flows. And the cash flows are not going into uh, big projects or long-term projects. Most of the projects are maintenance capital or short cycle, meaning that the payback is pretty quick. No one's, like I said before, no one's going to go out and go to their board and say, yeah, I want to do this $10 billion project in the Gulf of Mexico. Simply isn't going to happen. And in the meantime, the extraction of the resources continues on a daily basis, and you're not replacing. So you're setting yourself up for this tremendous uh, problem down the line. And uh, this is just, you know, anecdotal, I know, but I think it, I found it interesting. Something I'll be following more closely in the future. So speaking of that, I wanted to talk about uh, Schlumberger Q2 earnings. Uh, I looked at the transcript today, I think, it, or yesterday. And uh, I'll put a link to the transcript of the uh, conference call in the show notes. Very, very good. This is the 800-pound uh, gorilla of the oil field services sector. And so it pays to pay attention to what's going on. I mean, with the Halliburton earnings were tremendous last week or earlier this week. They said they're basically sold out of any frack uh, jobs for the rest of the year. They can't do any more. They're overloaded. And this is kind of keeps building confidence in this oil field services recovery that I've been talking about. It's inevitable. And we're seeing better and better news, but we're not seeing any... Um, rise in prices for the, a lot of these stocks. Why? Because people think we're in a recession. That's going to be, you know, oil prices are going to drop to $20 a barrel and who's going to invest in new production. That's, that's really the thinking and why we're not seeing this. But eventually, inevitably, these companies are going to have their day in the sun. And so we're seeing the momentum build quarter after quarter. The news is getting better. So here's a few highlights from the Schlumberger Q2 earnings uh, call. The second quarter was a defining moment in the overall trajectory of the year with significant growth in revenue, margin expansion, and earnings per share. 
Uh, we recorded four, a 14% revenue increase, the largest sequential revenue increase in more than a decade, as revenue growth exceeded rig count increase both internationally and in North America. So it sounds like the business is booming. The factors supporting pricing tailwinds, more specifically the tightening service supply capacity, both in North America and increasingly in an international markets will continue to operate on the defining characteristics of this upcycle and will support more revenue growth and margin expansion more than offsetting inflation. This is exactly what we were hoping to see that the pricing power would return and that they would be able to overcome the inflationary uh, imp impulses they were seeing in their businesses and uh, translate that to higher margins. So this is good news. This is, of course, the biggest company. You know, Baker Hughes reported their, their report wasn't that good. I didn't take a chance to look at it yet. But I will say that we are, in, we are speculating and investing in quite a few uh, smaller oil field services stocks in Canada. I'm hopeful to see that this same uh, revenue, cash flow, the same circumstances hopefully will apply to these companies. So we'll see as the earnings start rolling out, but this is very positive. And, uh, you know, I look at oil prices. Yes, we're in a recession. Um, other things that are happening around the world, like I said before, all these ebbs and flows. But we're, it's like we're looking for what's the low, you know, we, we see what, you know, the recent high was in oil, around $125, $130 a barrel. What's the floor, you know, even with all these recessionary uh, things going on, which is inevitably going to turn, you know, we're probably past the, uh, you know, we're on, we're on the, we're, we're past the majority of the liquidity tightening, I think, in this cycle. And we'll be, now it's time to start thinking about like, when will we start seeing um, uh, things shift. And I think personally, once people realize that the Fed, you know, is not, go you know, I think they're going to ease sooner than people think. And when they do, a lot of these things are going to explode to the upside, in my view. Um, you know, I don't, we've talked about this before, the view on the economy, I, I'm not a macro analyst. But this is my thinking uh, on this right now. It's showing up more and more in the data of the uh, markets of, of when we can anticipate, you know, the f interest rates to be cut. You know, think about it. You know, if the Fed raises back to back 70, 75 basis points, that gives them um, seven 25 basis point cuts. Think about it. So you you raise three quarters of a percentage, you raise three quarters of a percentage, and then you can cut seven times at, you know, and that that is how sediment and market viewing things can be changed. So um, as I've said before, I think as soon as we see any kind of, which I think we will see, because we talked about um, prices coming down everywhere now, rolling over, that once we see prices, uh, the CPI and, and, and these things, these measures of inflation, no, no matter how flawed they may be, as soon as they roll over, I think the Fed's going to take the opportunity to say, well, let's pause and see what, you know, is happening here. And, and then uh, that would be the time, in my view, to re-enter a lot of these positions or go, go whole hog. You know, people ask me, I'm putting together my list of junior gold stocks right now, but I don't feel it's time to buy yet. Um, but over the next couple few months it probably will be as we start seeing the approaching of the next liquidity cycle so uh lots of value there lots of value and some other things that are down 90 percent that i think are going to respond quite positively to uh a, a new liquidity cycle which i see happening and i think once we get out of this mindset that we're going to have this deflationary depression and oil prices are going to go to $20 a barrel. I know that's an extreme, but a lot of people, feel, you know, we don't know what the floor is on oil. Is it 85? Is it 75? Is it 65? We don't know. But regardless, you know, even if oil was to go to 50 or 45 and stay there, you know, for half a year, all it's going to do is exacerbate the lack of investment uh, that is needed. We are, you know, investment is coming back. That's why you're seeing Schlumberger and a lot of other oil field services uh, revenues up or good reports, but you also remember this industry has shrunk 
I mean, there's a lot of players that disappeared. These businesses had to shrink. And so, you know, you're seeing these, in, these increases of the business increase off a smaller base. And so it just doesn't going to have the capacity to absorb, you know, we're, we're, we're probably need, uh, we're probably behind on investing a half, one and a half to $2 trillion in new hydrocarbon investment. So um, it's going to come eventually because I think we're going to have a crisis in all time highs in oil prices at some point. And then uh, that'll be the time to, you know, we'll have to reassess, but that's what I think was eventually going to happen. We just simply have not invested enough all across the board. And this is very positive. I mean, this is the biggest company in the industry, but this is very positive. We have a lot of oil field services uh, holdings in the portfolio currently. Here we go again. This is a tweet uh, talking about uh, Valeris. That's an offshore oil rig company. Uh, people are sleeping on these rig day rates. They're really coming back, especially for the drill ships, which I believe are 100% sold out now. But you're starting to see day rates as high as $445,000 a day. This is pretty pretty decent. Uh, basically, it says interesting Val contract update, $86 million to reactivate uh, drill ship 17, stacked since 2018, 2019. Uh, rig, which is uh, Transocean, guided 50 to 75 million in Q1 for its drill ship. This is to reactivate them. You know, when you put them in, in layup, they're just sitting there tied to the pier. And so they do minimal maintenance on them to keep them from like, you know, sinking and stuff falling off. They've probably got a few guys on there chipping and paint and stuff and doing maintenance on motors and pumps. But to get the thing ready to go back to work costs this much. So they're not going to put it, they're not going to make this investment of, of, of reactivating the rig unless they have good contract uh, for a long period of time. And this is exactly what's starting to happen, evidently. Um, it says right down here, uh, Equinor, which is a Norwegian company, a 540-day contract for drill ship DS-17. The rig will be reactivated for this contract, which is expected to commence in mid-2023. The total contract value is approximately $327 million including upfront payment totaling 86 million for mobilization costs. So, uh, you know, we're starting to see this activity and people are sleeping on this. This industry is coming back. Again, it's another industry that was atrophied. That's, you know, uh, we've talked about in the past, we've had some false starts, but, you know, as long as oil doesn't go to Kathy Wood levels of $20 a barrel or whatever, and stay there, uh, you know, invest, reinvestment has to happen. And uh, again, the offshore industry has really shrunk quite a bit as it went through probably the biggest economic depression in its history. So we'll see, but this is, this, these are pretty, this is a pretty high rate for a drill ship. Uh, I mean, you're getting back to, you know, this is very profitable type, uh, type levels. And so we'll have to look at some of the other companies uh, as they start reporting and see, and see what the guidance is and see what they're seeing. But at, you know, over $100 Brent, I mean, people are going to be putting these things back to work. So wanted to get on this copper thing, you know, copper, they call it Dr. Copper. Copper's dropped quite a bit. We were pretty good on pulling the plug on it. Um, I don't look at it as a trade. I mean, copper is going to be affected by the econ economic uh, cycle. Wasn't hard to figure out. We were a little bit later because I thought the Chinese credit impulse would come through and, and keep the price up. Uh, as we showed in last week's video, the uh, Chinese are going into a liquefaction, uh, a credit impulse cycle now, a trillion dollar uh, investment cycle plus more liquidity, but it takes time for that to, to cycle through. And so, uh, again, I think copper is going to be a, uh, a big deal uh, this decade. I think it's going to make price. Gorin and Rosenzweig have forecasted that they could see copper over $10 a pound by the end of the decade. It makes perfect sense to me. But here's a slide from Freeport. Uh, it's a big copper miner. So current copper market conditions. The current price is insufficient to support new mine supply development. And so what do we have here? The incentive price, you know, the current price is down like about $3.30 a pound. The incentive price that uh, Wood McKenzie is saying is 425. So you need a sustained price of 425 to make new projects viable. And we're at 330. Um, copper structure, structurally supported by favorable long-term fundamentals. Physical demand remains strong. We know that. Inventory is low by historical standards. 
ongoing supply disruptions and social challenges in Latin America, and I'll talk about that some more in a minute. Secular growth in metals demand required for clean energy technologies. We've been talking about that since this channel has been on here. Copper is the metal for the green transition. Uh, project pipeline is thin and looming supply deficits. So uh, rapid decline reflects, uh, this is in the price, concerns about global economy, Chinese economic data, rising interest rates, strength of the US dollar. You know, the US dollar, is really a wet blanket on commodities. It's uh, to me how oil is held up with the dollar making you know decades levels uh, new highs has been amazing. It shows you it's even with copper. I mean, copper's still above three dollars a pound. Uh, so you know, again, I'll be looking to buy these companies back as we start seeing the uh, new credit impulse here in the U.S and the rest of the world as that, you know, people go from raising rates collectively around the world to start cutting them and reliquifying. This will be uh, a change from a headwind to a tailwind for these resources. Um, so, and like I said, Chinese now have started their credit impulse, uh, next credit impulse, and they are the majority they consume the most copper of anybody in the world or most resources for that matter. So this is what we're talking about here, uh, ongoing supply disruptions and social challenges in Latin America. Chile rejects second Anglo-American project in two months. Now remember, Chile was, is probably basically, along with Peru, is one of the biggest copper producers in the world. Uh, Chile basically is known for copper mining. Uh, it's been a very good place to mine copper, but you know we have recent government change there and uh now we're seeing some changes here uh, in the uh permitting and things like that it's something that we've talked about before is risk that exists around the world in all resource markets uh the political risk that you entail and then changes in government this is why people say well we shouldn't talk about politics and yada 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 this is why you have to do it because this has an effect so i'll put a link to this article you can read it yourself but anglo-american which is a very large mining company by the way has suffered a new setback in Chile after the Environmental Commission of Valparaiso rejected the company's $40 million operational continuity project for its El Soldado copper mine uh, north of the capital. This is the sixth mining project vetoed by the government of President Gabriel Boric, who assumed in March this year, and the second he I, I became, he was a new president. Uh, I believe that he was... Uh, more to the left, let's put it that way. Experts estimate that the copper industry needs to spend more than $100 billion to build mines to close what could be an annual supply deficit of 4.7 million tons by 2030. Um, there's gonna be a substantial gap in copper supply relative to demand. It's going to jeopardize the Green New Deal, if you will, the transition of trying to electrify everything. Copper is just a necessity for that. And this is not boding well that a place that basically, you know, built a lot of its wealth, built a lot of um, big reputation on mining copper now has uh, vetoed six mining projects just since March. So this is not good. This is, uh, you know, you need all, we need, basically need every project we can get and uh, you know, this, this is what we're seeing. So I'll put a link to the article, you can check it out. But this is not just in Chile, this is in other places. We're having more and more governments here in the US. Um, we've had the Biden administration uh, put the hiatus or make it more difficult for mining projects to move forward. So this is part of the, you know, people get upset, you know, because I get smart alecky about this, but how are you going to have a green transition? How are you going to how are you, if you don't mine it or grow it, you don't have it. And if you're not going to allow mining anywhere, then where are you going to get the minerals for this stuff? And nobody seems to understand that. They can't put, you know, this is what I describe as being stupid. Stupidity is not lack of intelligence or lack of education. Stupid, stupidity, in my view, is the ability to not understand uh, cause and effect. 
if you say that you uh, want to limit mining and limit the extractive industries, then you and you don't understand that you need these extracted materials to do something that you want to do, which is your main policy goal, which is the elimination of climate change, which ostensibly they believe a lot of people believe is going to be able to be done through renewables, then you, you can't that that's like diametrically opposed. Okay, and the inability for people to see that or rationalize that is stupid. So and this is what we're seeing. We're seeing more of it, not less of it. And this is why the investment theme, part of, part of the reason why the investment theme is so, uh, I'm so attracted to it because this is what we want to see, right? We want to see, you know, if the government is going to insert itself and not let new projects go forward and be a hassle for everyone and raise the cost of doing it and drag out the timelines, then that's going to be the benefit to speculators because as we said, we're already heading for a supply deficit. You know, I think the annual demand right now is like 23 or 24 million tons a year. You're talking about a five, almost a 5 million ton annual deficit by 2030. And you better get cracking on these new mines because you're already in 2022. So, so to permit, build, and commission a new large mine that's going to have an impact, it's probably going to take you five to seven years. So if you're putting up all these roadblocks with all these governments, where is the copper going to come from? Where is the nickel going to come from? Where's the Met coal going to come from? Nobody, you know, is a lot of people don't, or at least I shouldn't say a lot of people, policymakers don't seem to understand that for some reason. And that creates an opportunity for a speculator. And so just to talk about uh, copper intensity in a wind farm. So tons of copper that you need from uh, per megawatt on a wind farm, you know, you need 3.2 tons for the generator uh, in the wind turbine for the windings and such. Uh, transformer, you need 1.4 uh, tons per megawatt. Um, or should I say 1.4 tons for the transformer, talking about you know the, the, the each one of the wind turbines makes power and it goes through a smaller transformer, usually jacks up to 3,400 volts or 34,000 volts. Uh, and then that goes to the substation, collector substation, which brings it up to the utility uh, voltage, which is another big transformer, the main power transformer, which takes it from 34,000 volts to like 138,000 volts for the utility. So this is all copper, okay? Tower cables, uh, collector cables, uh, substation distribution cables. Okay, so you're, you know, you need 15.3 tons of copper per megawatt on a wind force. So you have a 100 megawatt uh, wind farm that shows you how many um, how many tons of copper that you need, and so this isn't just you know it's the same thing on a solar farm. You have you produce DC power. The DC cables are usually aluminum, but when you get to the inverter, you have a you know, components in there. You have a lot of copper in there. You have a transformer on there because after you invert the from the DC to the AC, it's a low voltage, and you step that up with a transformer on the inverter and then send it to the collector substation. So this is all copper, copper, copper all the time. And people are ignoring that or don't understand it or don't care. I don't know, but this is what creates the opportunity. You're not going to have a green transition and electrification of economies without more copper. And then you have major copper districts like in Chile canceling projects or putting projects on hiatus or whatever they're doing, uh, slowing it up. So this is, uh, you know, this is, this is going to lead to higher prices for copper. Here we go. Here's a slide. I think I have an article. Uh, most of the times I have these articles that I, that I have them, I, I put them in the show notes below. Demand for copper is booming, but supply can't keep up. Jeopardizing net zero emission targets, according to a new report from S&P &S Global. Copper is key to electric vehicles, wind and solar power, as well as the infrastructure that transports and stores renewable energy. S&P's global new report forecasts copper demand nearly doubling by 2035. It's not going to happen. Uh, the supply just can't keep up. So therefore, price will go up. That's my own comment. And that's my view. The energy transition is going to be dependent much more on copper than our current 
Energy Systems, said Daniel Jurgen, vice chairman of, at, at S&P Global. He's the guy that wrote the prize. He was a big oil guy at one time. Um, I guess he's the vice chairman at S&P Global now. But anyways, uh, again, this is what we've been talking about. This is, this is the opportunity. Um, and, but like I said, it's going to be punctuated with these cyclical declines as we have these you know, recessions and things of this nature. Those are, should be looked at as uh, tradable events. Now, I said I'm not a trader, but some of these things, are, they go in big cycles of several years. It's not like you're trading in and out every week. So it's, you know, it's not going to be hard to figure out when the copper price bottoms and then the Fed starts reliquifying the system, you need to get long, okay? And then you ride it up the next cycle. And then, you know, as we, as they start talking about, you know, thing, you're gonna, they're going to pinch back uh, liquidity, then you, you would exit. So that this is, or, or at least be looking to exit. So these, these are gonna happen over years, okay? It's not gonna be like, you know, every other week you're gonna be in and out. It doesn't move that, it, you know, once these trends get into place, they usually stay in place for, for quite a bit of time. And so here's a good chart that I like. This is the, uh, this is total liquids demand, global liquids demand. A couple of things I wanna point out here. You see the trend line over time, how slowly grows over time, the demand for oil. This is what we've talked about before. This is a good illustration if you just follow kind of this, this uh, average here. Usually population growth, you know, one to one and a half percent a year growth in oil demand. And so, you know, here's the 2008 great financial crisis. It dropped off. It immediately rebounds, right? Because the ascent of man requires, you know, as people become more wealthy and, and have uh, more complex lives, it requires more energy inputs. And so here was the COVID worldwide lockdown. This is one thing I wanted to point out. You know, we're at 100 million barrels a day of, of demand prior to the uh, pandemic. And then we locked the world down. But you notice we only dropped, we only dropped 15 million barrels a day. And then you see how it recovered. Uh, it's been recovering. So we're below the trend line. So we're right about, you know, around 90 something, 98, 99 million barrels a day. But if we would have stayed on trend, we would be somewhere around 105 million barrels a day. And the reason why is demand hasn't fully recovered. Uh, Chinese uh, lockdowns, things of this nature is moving barrels. And I'll show you a, a graph on that. But what I'm trying to show you is this is relentless increase in hydrocar in uh, global oil demand, liquids demand. So we're under the trend that you know we should be. This is good for several things. This is good for exploration, oil field services, tankers, because the tanker fleet has not grown. <coughs> Excuse me. But the amount of oil that needs to be moved and products is going to increase. So eventually, you know, China. China's going to come back. Uh, all these places will have these huge populations that are going through their S curve of demand growth are going to continue putting relentless demand, uh, upward demand uh, on oil. And we haven't made the investments. So that's why I said, you know, how far is the price really going to drop? And I've been shocked even with the dollar at, you know, multi-decade highs, even with recession, uh, we're in a recession with all these things going on. You know, WTI is still like $95 a barrel and Brent's over 100 still. So um, unless we do have a, even if we have a great financial crisis, how much is it going to, this was 2008. I mean, you really have to lock the world down, okay? And it only dropped 15%. And that was for a short period of time. And as soon as they took their foot off people's necks, it started recovering immediately. So this was a big deal. Um you know, we had already not been investing enough, but this further two year gap of lack of investment is really going to be the nail in the coffin and why I think inevitably uh, over the next several years, we're going to have record oil prices. We just, you know, this was like an art of, this was like a punch to the gut to an industry that had already been under investing. So we're talking about Chinese oil demand, you know, this is, you know, they were topping out at about 14 million barrels a day. This is from Raymond James. They forecasted that Chinese demand could be down 2 million barrels a day, down to about 11 and a half, a little bit over 11 and a half million barrels a day. But this is what they see happening going forward as we recover, Chinese demand recovers. Uh, I think that's reasonable. 
uh, unless you think that they're just going to stay in these COVID lockdowns forever. I, I, I don't see that as being viable. I'm not sure they're going to do that. Uh, but, you know, this is where more demand growth can come back. And then you throw that on top of what's going on in India, Indonesia, the, all these other places that are growing, sub-Saharan Africa, forget about it. I mean, we, we're not going to have enough oil. Price is going to have to ration. And uh, maybe it's not going to be this year or next year, but at some point we are. And I can tell you that with some of the cash flows we're already seeing, uh, like I said, these in, this industry of oil field services and offshore has been so decimated that they will not be able to handle the, the, the money flows when they come in as the, as the business comes back, because eventually you have to, um, you have to go out and look for more oil if you're in the oil business, or like I said, you go out of business. So I think this is positive. You know, that's 2 million barrels of demand that's not in the market right now that's going to come back at some point. Again, investment into new production has declined over the 10 years. This is your major oil companies. Like we've showed something similar to this before. Chevron, Exxon, Shell, BP, Eni, which is an Italian company, Total, which is a French company. You can see they kind of maxed out in you know, 2013 or so. They were, they were growing their investment. This is you know, typical cyclical the response you would see and they weren't, you know, and then what you've seen since, since 2013, 14 is a steady decline. And so this is just another data point showing that we haven't invested enough. And I think that investment will come over time as confidence builds and as the price is sustained at a higher level for oil. And so here's Javier Blas. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about this last week, but he, uh, this Bloomberg picked this up. Uh, during the U.S. President Joseph Biden's trip to Saudi Arabia, the world was so focused on how Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman would respond to his plea to pump more oil that it missed a bombshell, the level at which Saudi oil production will peak. That's what we talked about last week. We were talking about this. The Saudis don't have the ability that they said that people assume that they they didn't necessarily say it. They just kind of played along. They didn't, they didn't not say it, but they didn't say it. And, but, you know, we'll, they said they'll be able to raise production over 13 million bar barrels a day, but by 2027. So let's go on and see what the rest of this article says. It's a lot lower than many anticipated. It's lower than the, the Saudis have ever in intimated. And with the world still hungry for fossil fuels, it spells long-term trouble for the global economy. For years, Saudi oil ministers and royals have sidestepped one of the most important questions the energy market faces. What is the long-term upper limit of the kingdom's oil fields? The guesstimate was that they could always pump more and for longer. If the Saudis knew the answer, they kept it a secret. And then almost casually on Saturday, Prince Mohammed broke the news, revealing that the ultimate maximum capacity is 13 million barrels a day. Prince Mohammed framed his answer, emphasizing that the world and not just countries like Saudi Arabia needs to invest in fossil fuels production over the next two decades to meet growing global demand and avoid energy shortages. Quote, the kingdom will do its part in this regard as it announced an increase to its production capacity to 13 million barrels per day, after which the kingdom will have not have any additional capacity to increase production. And so the market is going to have to digest this over time. That the Saudis simply, you know, I just showed you what's happening in the U.S. shale basins. Okay, they're they're in decline. They're going to peak. People that were commenting on the Dallas Fed Energy Survey, people that are in the business, we're going to peak in the next five years. Where is the investment going to come from? A lot of it's going to have to come from offshore. Those are that's going to be a tremendous boom. I think you're going to see a huge boom offshore over the next five to ten years. And like I said, the industry has shrunk. So the remaining players are going to have a bonanza. Then to finish this article, it bears repeating, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, the holder of the world's largest oil reserves, is telling the world that in the not so distant future, it will, quote, not have any additional capacity to increase production, unquote. Let that sink in. I think it's even worse. I mean, their oil fields, Garwar, some of these other oil fields are 50, 60, 70 years old. They've been milking them. What's the condition of these oil fields? 
Okay. People that are in the oil industry know, yes, these were tremendous uh, world beaters that, you know, basically made Saudi Arabia very wealthy. We got spoiled on that cheap flowing crude. They could sink a well over there and get 10, 15, 20,000 barrels a day in these huge, huge pools of oil, but they've been exploited now for decades. And like I said, where are the new giant fields? There aren't any. You're finding smaller fields in more inhospitable places offshore in the Arctic. Why are you drilling in the Arctic if oil's so plentiful? Why are you drilling in 20,000 feet of ocean if oil's so plentiful? And so this is, uh, this is the problem we're gonna run into. And uh, I don't think people are paying enough attention. People are focusing too much on the short term. If you, and I'm not a trader, okay? I'm not gonna sit here and try to guess you know, when to get in and out of these companies. This is, to me, set in stone what's going to happen. We are going to have an energy crisis. It is going to be bad. However, it's going to lend itself to a tremendous opportunity, okay, for those that understand what's going to happen and can understand that it's going to be a volatile trip. That's the problem, right? The volatility is what drives people out, or they try to get cute and trade, and this is, you know, and then they miss the majority of these moves. I'm not a trader. Some people... I don't, like somebody else said, I don't see any traders on the Fortune Forbes 500 or 400 wealthiest people in the world. Maybe there are a couple on there, people that have, uh, you know, short periods of time where they're successful trading, but, you know, I'm not that guy and most people that are listening to this aren't that guy. So I think the best thing to do is understand long-term trends, get in them early and ride them. And I think, this is becoming very apparent to me what's going to happen. Higher prices for a longer period of time. Okay, hate to pick on Germany, but we got to go back there. It's interesting because I saw this week that the EU kind of quietly um, lifted sanctions on a few Russian banks, specifically around in the trade of agricultural products and fertilizer. And so we're starting to see maybe some of those sanctions uh, because it's to their advantage, right? They, they need the food and need the fertilizer, not just in Europe, but around the world. And so I think you're starting, and you're going to see the same thing happen in energy inevitably. Um, and I just don't see, you know, we've seen now the P prime minister in Great Britain is out, Draghi in Italy is out, the Estonian prime minister is out, you've got riots You've got civil unrest going on amongst farmers in multiple countries. You have people are ticked off. Polls are shifting against Davos, man, and globalization and this war in Ukraine. People are not interested in becoming poor over this. And it's slowly sinking in, okay? And if these governments don't change their views and, you know, make some changes here pretty quickly, you'll be facing a tremendous burden this winter. And the burden on industry is such that, as I've said before, if some of these companies have to shut down units or plants or their entire business because there's an energy crisis, they will not more than likely restart their businesses, okay? So here's this slide. German industry would need to curtail production to save more energy. Germany's chemical industry, which is the largest in the world, by the way, and employs tens of thousands of people in Germany. German chemical industry has already done everything it can to conserve gas use, said Chemical Association, BCI, on Tuesday, which warned that the only steps, le steps left for the industry would be to scale back or abandon production altogether. Remember, natural gas does a couple of things in a chemical plant. It's a feedstock for uh, to create, you know, hydrocarbon chains, which are used in plastics and other products. Not only that, it's used in furnaces for the process in the uh, cogeneration uh, and the power plants in these places where they make steam for the process, chemical process plus electricity. And so, you know, think about if Germany is the largest producer of chemicals in the world, which it is, um, and it's forced to curtail or shut down production. What does that do to the supply chain? What does that do? What are the knock on effects of that? Okay. And I hate to keep picking on Germany, but it's, it's like the fourth largest economy in the world. It has very important 
uh, place in the world economy in the globalized supply chain. And these, these, the unions there, the business leaders, they're all warning the government. And the government doesn't know what to do. They're trapped by their own ideology, their own belief system. And, you know, they, 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 it took, you know, this Herculean effort to get the Siemens gas turbine back from, back from um, Canada to uh, Nord Stream 1, okay? And, they, you know, it's going to come back. But we see that Nord Stream 1 is only going at like 30 or 40% of its capacity. You know, what a real leader would do is say, look, this isn't working. We made a mistake. Um, things didn't progress like we thought. And not only are we going to lift the sanctions on gas because we need it for our own survival and for our own, you know, edification uh, of our economy. And if that means I'm voted out for flip-flopping, that's what, that's what ends up happening. But if you explain to people why you do things, you know, they're going to be more, apt. if you just wait for this thing to, you know, implode, it's like somebody that has a lump in their chest or, or, or somewhere on their body. And they're like, well, should I go get that checked out? That's probably nothing. I'll just ignore it. And it keeps growing and growing and growing at some point. Okay. That tumor becomes so large or metastasizes and then causes your body to break down that you're going to be forced to go to the hospital. Then it's going to be too late. That's the situation we have here, but that's how politics works, right? These people are ideologues. They've been saying the same thing for 25 or 30 years in their political career. Do you expect them to just step up now and say, you know what, uh, what we thought was going to work with our sanctions didn't work. Um, we're going to reverse it now and let the chips fall where they may. That's what a pragmatic leader would do. Um, but that's not how most people operate in politics. So we'll see. But uh, this has the uh, ability, this has the this has the chance to really be a big deal. And I can, that's why I continue to follow it. I mean, Germany is not some piker country. It's a very important producer of intermediate and finished goods uh, that the rest of the world needs. And so um, here's, what this, here's where this is uh, going now. Here's a tweet uh, in Germany. And again, my German Listeners can tell me if I'm off base or if this is just uh, hyperbole or if this is actually what you're hearing also. I've had a lot of good uh, listeners from Germany and subscribers write back and say, you know, some of the things uh, that we're talking about here is, in fact, you know, a lot of it is what's actually happening. So we appreciate our listeners in Germany, our subscribers in Germany feeding us information. But anyways, this tweet says, in Germany, politicians now warning citizens to be prepared for blackouts gas shortages and energy bills of 1,500 to 3,000 euros. I don't know if that's for the winter, for the year, for the month, I don't know. But anyways, it goes to say a disaster waiting to happen. You know, a lot of people, I didn't realize this in Germany, you know, rent uh, apartments and stuff, uh, even houses. And then there's laws around how much you can raise utility bills and things like this. So there's a lot of checks there, I think. But in the end, I mean, we just saw one of the biggest um, ut gas utilities there, I think, going to receivership and the German government had to step in. Uniper, I think it was called. I can't remember. But, you know, if you look at the power prices all across Europe, if you look at the gas prices, they're outrageous. They're like five or 10 times in different countries what they normally are. People can't pay these bills. It's not like people have unlimited money. And then, you know, this, this, is a, this is a potential disaster. You know, we talked about it last week about them putting out, like, they're going to have warming rooms. You can go there if you're too cold and just, like, get warm. This is a developed OECD country, a manufacturing powerhouse, having heating rooms, okay, or running out of firewood because people are running around trying to get firewood stocked up for the, for the winter. I mean, this is, this is not normal. Okay, I believe that's it for this week. Oh. Wait, here we go. I was talking about this earlier. Um, sanctions relaxed were convenient for the EU. Uh, EU, this is a, also on a Reuters article. EU to permit unfreezing of some resources owned by sanctioned Russian banks to allow transactions for food and fertilizer trade. So, and there's a comment here, the unwinding of sanction begins. Yes, where it's convenient. They, they have no choice. And then I saw, you know, some wag on Twitter said, well, it's not really a big deal because Russian fertilizer is of low quality and no one really cares. Okay, well, I mean, this is what we, this is all this cope. 
there's a lot of cope going on because people have emotionally invested themselves in this whole thing. And so there's a lot of coping going on. So when your brain is receiving information, you know, that you've, you know, you've committed yourself to, for whatever reason, because you're a true believer or a virtue signaler or whatever, uh, and uh, you've committed yourself to this course, and then data comes in that's contrary to that, then there's coping goes on because people's egos, okay, people don't like to admit they were wrong. Okay, it's, it's, it's hard for their ego to take. Uh, we're all guilty of that. And so here's what we have. This is, you know, of course, being done very quietly. But then you see the cope. Well, you know, uh, okay, we're going to rate, we're going to allow Russian fertilizer exports, but it's low quality and not a lot of people use it anyways. Okay, fine, whatever. What I'm saying is this isn't winning. For people in the West, this is an indication to me of winning. Uh, the Russian economy is doing fine. Uh, from what I understand, I see, I follow different Russian, you know, channels on YouTube. People are in store. I don't see bare shelves. I see the bare shelves on the, in the US, but I don't see them really in Russia too much, but I'm not everywhere in Russia. I see that they're putting up new apartment buildings in Mariupol. Those are under construction, they're cleaning up the place. Um, you know, that's winning. Uh, and people in the West are not winning. So at what point do people in the West say, this course of action we took is not working and we need to figure a exit ramp off here? Okay, let me just say that that's going to be hard for people to swallow. I understand that, but it's going to have to happen. You know, there's a few wags out there or, you know, people that are just say stuff. But I don't think the consensus person wants their standard of living to go down, to have food shortages, to have their industry shut down. And, you know, for what? Is it working? What's the payoff for this? Because nothing is working. Okay, nothing seems to be working in this war against Russia. And uh, we, more weapons are sent. Um, more guys get killed. I don't see any massive, we keep hearing about these massive offensives, counter offensives that are going to happen. And I think that the, the regime or the government in Kiev understands that they're running out of, the sand's running out of the hourglass. They have to demonstrate that they can uh, beat back the Russians somewhere uh, so that they can keep the money flow going. You know, if, if the West cuts off, they're subsidizing the Ukrainian government. There's no industry in Ukraine right now. The economy's contracted by 50%. And the major areas that contributed a large part of the economy are now going to be under Russian control. There's not a lot of industry in the, in the West of Ukraine. Most of the productive farmlands in the East, most of the industries in the East, okay? And a lot of it's been destroyed or damaged, uh, I'll grant you that. But you know, if we don't continue, if the West collectively doesn't send Ukraine $10 billion a month and keep sending weapons, it's over. Forget about the weapons. If we don't send the money every month, it's over. The place is going to implode. Okay. And uh, so I don't know what the breaking point is, if it's going to be the Ukrainian government itself, the troops in the field, the population in Western Europe or the US that gets sick of subsidizing this to their own economic detriment. But I could be wrong. Maybe people uh, are going to adopt like a World War II mindset and they're going to take the bit in their mouth and endure the shortages, endure the pain for what they perceive as, you know, uh, democracy or values that they have or whatever. That's certainly possible. My bet is they won't. Uh, I've seen people get irate in a Chick-fil-A drive through because it's taking too long, three or four minutes more than they thought to get their sandwich and they're going nuts. OK, I don't think they're going to want their standard of living to go down uh, dramatically or be inconvenienced over something that they don't really even have any kind of ties to or care about. But that's my own view. Uh, you can let me know what you think in the in the uh, show notes. OK, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, lots of things going on. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to bring you that news, those data points re-explain our thesis of what we think is going to happen over the long term, but, but yet the ripples and the ups, the cyclical ups and downs in the, in the intermediate and short term. But I think if you can look past that, the opportunities are, are, are there. The opportunity uh, setup is there if you can look past that. So uh, depending on your mentality, depending on your risk tolerance, it, that's going to dictate how you uh, uh, try to approach this these uh, themes as a speculator or investor. 
So I hope this uh, was helpful for you. Uh, again, please like, share, uh, and uh, comment. It helps the channel. We appreciate it. And the channel continues to grow. And uh, like I said before, if this type of information and thought process is something that you're interested in, uh, consider a subscription to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. This is where we try to find investment themes that uh, can take advantage of the things we talk about in these videos. Okay, guys, that's it for me this week. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Take care.